So it's the 5th of April, Sunday, and I'm talking from Cornwall, and I wanted to share a few thoughts about coronavirus and theology. For me, at least, COVID-19 and all it implies has meant that I've had to rethink my whole approach to God. The way I see it, there's a kind of feeling around, and it's understandable, that we deserve this, that we've treated the whole world, the planet, badly and that this is a crisis of our own making. And in a sense it is, because of course the uh, original virus came from a meat market that was in some way contaminated, so market selling wild animal meat in, in China. And uh, there was some form of cross-contamination or something of that kind that led to the, the first virus coming out. But there have been issues like this before. And this is not just a virus. It's a plague. It's a plague in the real sense of the, the concept of a plague. So where do we go with this thing? We deserve it. We don't deserve it is not the issue. It is of our making. God didn't deliver us this coronavirus. We started the whole business. So the point is that Originally, God gave all of creation free will. That's not just us. We are not unique. Now, this, again, is something that is self-evident from the writing of Paul and from Mullah Sadra in Islam. The whole idea, the whole concept that all of creation is alive. Well, whether you believe all of creation is alive in a tangible sense or not, is not the point. All of creation has freedom. All of creation has freedom of action. And mankind is not unique. The animal kingdom is not unique. Life is not unique. Everything in the universe, the universe itself, has freedom of action. It was set in motion, if you like. It began with a big bang. And then away you go. There was no predetermined course for creation and that's very important and yes you say okay but mankind had a special place mankind were given freedom free will no not just mankind all of creation otherwise we'd be walking around in some perpetual garden of eden and how delicious it would be but it would be no life if you were in an environment that was structured for you like a film set where nothing could go wrong where you couldn't damage it in such a way as it did go wrong where it had where there was no chance to it where it was an ordered orderly garden of eden some elysian fields in which you walked with god you'd have no real true freedom of action it would be a farce of a creation. You would destroy the whole purpose of creation. It's only because God takes his hand away from the created universe. Father, Mother, God, he, she, whatever you call God, she took her hand away from creation. Now, does that mean she has no control? No, I believe that God can and does act. God can intervene in response to prayer, but he is kind of tabid al-kul, as the, as the Coptic Christians, the Arab Christians say, tabid al-kul, the controller of all, the conductor of all, not, not almighty in the sense that he can predetermine what's going to happen. God can't change your past, nor can he or she predetermine your future. If God chose to predetermine your future, you would be pointless. And God would have been wasting his time. God cannot predetermine the future. God cannot change the past. And in that sense, God is not almighty. God is the conductor of everything, like a conductor of an orchestra. He does, he can, he will tweak things. But whether the individual instruments in the orchestra play well or not is down to the individual instruments in the orchestra. 
they all have freedom. The conductor can only do his best with the tools he's given, and the tools are you and me, and the butterfly and the bee, and the volcano and the virus. So all of it comes together. All of it has freedom. And then something beautiful is created. And yes, God can intervene. God does intervene and will intervene on, well, in regard to prayer. If there's real, sincere, and powerful prayer, God will answer that prayer, particularly if answering that prayer does not subvert his purpose, his purpose being to give creation free will. So if you are praying to subvert the purpose of creation, well, it'll count in the balance. If you pray, let's have an end to war, it's a beautiful prayer. It'll nudge things in the right direction, but it's not going to stop war tomorrow because that would be the end of our free will. That would be the end of the entire purpose of mankind. But it, it's effective. It works up to a point. What works much more definitely is if you say, okay, I want Charlie there to be less violent. I believe if you have a specific prayer about a specific person, that can make a difference. It is hard to pray on life or death issues, however because you're praying to a God who doesn't believe in death. If I pray a prayer for my mother not to die, for example, and I, and I might well do that, and I do do that. It's a difficult prayer. It's not an impossible prayer, but it's a difficult prayer because God doesn't believe in death. God doesn't see death. God sees us as living forever. But you can call God to account for things that he has done or failed to do, and God is answerable. If we call him to account for coronavirus, he might say, you did it, sort it out yourself. And we have the power to sort it out. We have the potential to sort this issue out. So we have to take and shoulder our own responsibility in this world. That's a definite. Nonetheless, God has an obligation to us. God made us. God is a parent to us in a very real sense. It is exactly in that sense that God created us. And therefore, yes, you can ask and you can ask persistently and ask re real passion for what you want and expect God to answer your prayer. And you have every right to expect God to answer your prayer. After all, we are his children, and God cannot exist without creation. This is a concept I picked up from Mullah Sadra, the Islamic philosopher, and it seems very un-Islamic at, at first thought, but, but it's true, I think. God can't exist without creation, without a created universe, because it's in God's nature to create. It's in God's nature. It's in the nature of life to create life. And God is life. It's not really possible to limit God by saying, oh, God existed before creation. No, from the beginning, God created because it's in God's nature to create. It's not this or that. You can't have God and then later you have creation, God in some vast eternal void. It doesn't work that way. It's in the nature of life to create life. God made us, ergo God needs us. Therefore, God has an obligation to see things work out for us. And is it possible there's no God? I mean, if so, my whole approach to life for years would have been a joke with no cosmic joker to enjoy it. It would be farcical. And <laughs> but that's possible, isn't it, in theory? But it's not it doesn't gel with my own experience. So is there a purpose to creation? Well yes I believe there is. As a child is nurtured until it becomes an adult, so creation is nurtured until it grows up and you get this concept in Christian theology, I guess, because we talk of a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. I mean, there is a fulfillment in things. Things will reach a conclusion, at least I believe so, in the eternal balance. 
And that's great because it's a future not even God controls because God has given free will to creation. So their potential is unbelievable, really unbelievable. It's just astounding what may happen in the fullness of time as all of creation, including mankind, grows and develops into such a state that it is a true counterpoint to God. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful concept because the child grows and becomes something. The possibilities are endless. And was there something before God? Was there a, a beforeness, a beginning, uh, somehow that all of creation and God himself or herself came out of? Well, there it was this guy called Plotinus, Plotinus, I don't know how you pronounce his name, uh, one of the ancients who used to postulate that there was kind of, a kind of dyad from, uh, from which all was created. God was created and creation was created out of this, which is kind of like the ancient Egyptian concept that there is, uh, and, and the biblical concept, the wind on the waters, you know, that there's an original something out of which all comes. And I've seen some modern Israeli scientists talking about the same sort of idea. And why not? A kind of lake of love out of which all and everything evolves. Love is eternal. Love is the only, the only thing that matters. Love and loyalty, in my book, are the only thing, the only great eternal qualities or truth, I suppose. But truth is is a function of love in that sense. Love is eternal, and the scriptures tell us God is love. Yes, I don't see why not why there isn't some precursor to God and creation that is a kind of lake of love, a kind of eternal concept. It's time to rethink things in these post-coronavirus moments. So it's a challenging time, a time when we can all think again about God and think again about our approach to God. But we can't blame coronavirus and all that it represents on God. We can pray to get through it, get through it and come through it better than we started. And there's every chance that we may do exactly that. God protect and keep you all in these desperate times.